the German annexation of Austria in March of 1938, often just referred to as the Anschluss, was a critical moment in European diplomacy in the run-up of World War II. It redefined the political positions of Germany and Italy in Europe, and specifically towards each other. It sealed the fate of Czechoslovakia and allowed the Germans easier access to their future allies in southeastern Europe. Let's look at this map of 1937. In the center, here in the yellow, sits the Republic of Austria. It is bordered by Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Italy, Switzerland and Liechtenstein. The Republic, established after the breakup of Austria-Hungary, faced numerous diplomatic and domestic threats that would all work together to ensure its eventual integration into Germany. Austria's democracy had quickly fallen under continuous rule of the Christian Social Party, a political force of conservative Catholics with certain authoritarian tendencies. After six different CSP chancellors, the seventh, Engelbert Dollfuss, transformed the country into an autocratic one-party state formed around the new Fatherland Front. Dollfuss, who became the founder of Austro-Fascism, led the country until he was assassinated by Austrian Nazi sympathizers during an attempted coup. His successor became Kurt Schuschnigg. Schuschnigg's ideology was deeply shaped by the reality of the growing threat of German annexation, which he strongly opposed. The only ally, though, that Austria's fascist leader could find against Germany's fascist leader was Italy's fascist leader, Benito Mussolini. Italy became Austria's protector, which was mutually beneficial for both sides. Austria could refocus its military forces towards its more threatening neighbors, to a lesser extent Yugoslavia in the south, to a larger extent Germany in the north. In 1936, the two countries' general staffs had agreed on Italian assistance for Austria in case for foreign invasion. Austria, as part of the centralization of the country around the Fatherland Front, had built up the Front Miliz units against Germany in the north, and against Yugoslavia in the south. Alfred Janza, who had risen to chief of staff in Austria in 1935, was committed to keep his country independent from Germany and developed a military strategy named for him the Janza Plan. Janza had initially crafted that plan around the idea of Italian assistance, but the geostrategic situation between the two fascist dictators had soon changed. Mussolini had evicted himself from the international community after the war in Ethiopia in 1935 and 1936. Subsequently, Italy on one side and France and Britain on the other viewed each other with growing suspicion, driving Italy into Germany's camp. Although Mussolini originally rejected German requests for an alliance, which would only come about in 1939, it was Mussolini who defined the term Axis powers in the first place, when he announced to the world on 1st of November 1936 an axis between Berlin and Rome around which the continent would rotate. Italy had signed a friendship agreement with the Germans, and the Austrian military leadership soon came to realize that they could not expect Italy to follow up on its pledge of military protection in the case of German invasion. So Janza redefined the plan. Realizing the German military superiority, he built his idea around the West Army, the Western Army, a military formation to be positioned in the region of Upper Austria where Janza anticipated the main German attack thrust. But soon, even the idea of bitter resistance to provoke intervention by France and the United Kingdom on Austria's behalf fell flat. The two countries reiterated to Austria that they were not willing to stand up for its defense. But with Britain, France and Italy out of the way, who else could Austria turn to? Well, nobody. Hungary to the east, still bitter about the brief ethnic Hungarian uprising against Austria in the Burgenland in 1921, was not interested in keeping Germany away from its border. In fact, Budapest sought close alignment with Berlin, particularly against its rivals in Czechoslovakia and Romania. Yugoslavia to the south had been hostile to Austria since both countries' emergences after World War I. The constant fear of Habsburg restoration and the transformation of Austria into a once more militaristic autocracy led Yugoslavia to see to constant military presence on its northern border. The German-Austrian unification with the Anschluss would have eliminated that threat for Yugoslavia, which is why they saw no reason to prevent it. Czechoslovakia to the north, meanwhile, was Austria's perhaps friendliest neighbor, but the Czechoslovak strategic location, which will become important very soon, should not have made military resistance against Germany any easier. And of course, 
Switzerland and Liechtenstein to the west were more concerned with neutrality than with aiding Austria against German threat. And so it came that in early 1938, the German government bullied the Austrians into submission. Against the futile resistance of the President of Austria, the National Socialist Artur Seyss Inquart became Chancellor. He used the political system that was set up by the Fatherland Front to get to work to assure Austria's annexation without any parliamentary opposition. He was Chancellor of Austria for only three days and would later go on to hold high-ranking positions in Nazi leadership. As Reichskommissar für die Niederlande, he oversaw the murders of about 110,000 Dutch Jews, with only 30,000 surviving the war. Zeiss Inquart was even named foreign minister under Karl Dönitz in Hitler's political testament. He was one of the 24 chief war criminals judged at Nuremberg. But let's get back to the Anschluss for a second. The Germans, now that Austria was part of their territory, had given themselves a new strategic headache. Look at the current border between Germany and the Czech Republic. It's a long border, but not too bad. But now check out this border in summer of 1938. Czechoslovakia thrusted deep into Germany's eastern flank, and with its relatively powerful army, well-developed armament industry, and active diplomatic ties to France, posed a more immediate military threat to Germany than, say, Poland. Germany would go on about countering that threat immediately. The Germans first managed to negotiate for themselves the Munich Agreement, taking large parts of Czechoslovakia's German-speaking population, but critically, also its border fortifications. The Germans also supported Polish and Hungarian ambition against Czechoslovakia, and in March of 1939, under the cover of a Slovakian insurgency against Czech dominance, invaded the remainders of the Czech lands and constructed a puppet state in the Slovak ones. But that's a story for another time. Thanks for watching.